Hello and welcome to Crushing Doubts Q&A every Thursday at 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Pacific. It's great to be here with you all again. I missed you last week, but looking forward to talking about mind-body issues and furthering your understanding of them, because really that's what it's all about, whether it's the Q&A or coming to see me in any format. My goal is to get you information that furthers your quest to get rid of your symptoms. When I was getting better from my eight-year back pain experience and I discovered Dr. Sarno, there were a lot of things that I needed to figure out still, even after reading Dr. Sarno. And it's the, the questions that can get you to the answers. But of course, you do need somebody who can help you get those answers. So that's part of what I'm here for. I encourage you all, ask your questions, and uh, we're going to get you answers. <clears throat> now, within the system that I work in, the way that I came to get better from my symptoms, it slowly but surely got organized into a system where I could understand mind-body symptoms in three different ways. And so I call this the three column system because what I discovered is that columns have, uh, sorry, symptoms have different functions. So sometimes people would say to me, uh, well, actually I would say to myself, how come it's supposed to be emotional life causes mind body symptoms, but I'm not having anything that big emotionally right now. Mostly I notice what I'm really having is just lots of thoughts about how it doesn't make sense to me. Why this? Why that? Why did Dr. Sarno say this? Why am I hearing this from somebody else? Why is it this way at one time and this way at another? So this Q&A is designed to get you answers <clears throat> to break up all of those confusions, to answer the seeming contradictions in one system. I'm happy to answer any questions. And for anybody who's new here, uh, please do uh, comment, make questions about, well, what do you mean about the columns? What are these columns? I'll give you it in brief, and then we'll dive in with some questions. So these three columns are the emotions column, the doubt column, and the power column. The emotions column is really what Sarno talked about <clears throat> in large measure, which is when you have some kind of unconscious emotional experience, sometimes a symptom will come in as a psychological distraction to prevent you from knowing about that emotion. But that's for the onset and uptick in symptoms. For the ones that really just stay and are always there, especially in severe form, that's what I call the doubt column. That means the symptoms are there because you are having re repeating thoughts. And whatever we think leads to a physiological process. So if you're thinking the same thing over and over, sure enough, your symptoms aren't going to budge. That's the doubt column for you. The power column is for something else. That is for when you get stuck on uh, what I call symptom plateaus, where you're getting better, but you're not all the way better. And you're just kind of stuck there. And typically what happens, especially once you've gotten past a certain point where you've maybe mastered that emotional stuff and you even have brought doubt down low, you can have some anxiety or feelings about becoming powerful. Because the fact is we all get messages from society about whether it's okay to be powerful or not. And the power column is designed to help you recognize your relationship with you and anything that stands in the way of you getting better. So that's the basic summation. Let's talk more about it. Let me say hi to a couple of people who have joined me here. Justine is here from uh, Australia. Thanks for joining us here, and good morning. And uh, Ross Mark is here, my good friend Ross. Good to see you here, Ross. If you have questions, let me know. Rita, thank you for joining us and saying hi. Appreciate it. Okay, now we have some people on YouTube who have some questions lined up. Let's dive right in. <clears throat> Beth Fowler, good to see you here. Hi, Dr. Dan. Two weeks ago, we completed my core narrative, and that was quite a core narrative. You did a great job. Now, she says, pain is worse. Sit tight before you panic when you hear that. I think, good. It's doubt trying to hang on. And I also think, let's get to the next comment, crap. It's natural progression of a constant, seven-year-long, unknown, incurable disease. Either way, it's MBS or TMS. MBS is mind-body syndrome. TMS is tension myositis syndrome, and that's what Sarno called this. Um, it doesn't matter what term you call it. I, I just call it mind-body issues. I've tried to get away from any term or I just take all the terms to mean the same thing. All it is, is the mind is controlling the body. And the way that I think about it is that if your body can have that experience, the mind-body process can co-opt it. doesn't matter what the symptom is. Now, let's get to the heart of what Beth's saying here. When the pain goes up with the core narrative being completed, she's got two separate thoughts. One is good. It's doubt trying to hang on. That's her saying, hey, this is starting to make sense to me. Um, I know I'm making progress. Doubt's just trying to hang on. That one is definitely right, Beth. Now, this second one, crap, it's natural progression of a constant seven-year-long unknown incurable disease. 
Now, it's interesting because between that sentence and the next one, either way, it's MBS TMS. I think there's some doubt in that second sentence, which no surprise, you cannot crush doubt if you can't let it in first. And we're all going to have doubts. But I think what you're saying, Beth, is, you know, some part of you thinks, okay, we're making progress. Doubt's just trying to hang on. I don't need to worry about this too much. Or what if it is this unknown incurable disease? Well, I have a good piece of logic that can really slam that second one, that second doubt, or that actually it's the first doubt, but the second sentence. And that is, what are the chances that some long unknown incurable disease heard your core narrative and suddenly you got worse? Diseases don't work like that. You know, you don't hear diabetics saying, oh, I did a core narrative and suddenly my, uh, my pancreas didn't work doesn't happen that way. If it changes with your psychology, it is mind body. So this is um, a key variable that people can discover to to get their doubt down is when their symptoms go up sometimes when they're getting a certain um, insight, that's still a sign that the mind body process is controlling the level of the symptom. Once we know that Beth will be able to get it under control. So it won't just go up, it'll also go down. And we're going to do that. That first sentence, good, it's doubt trying to hang on, 100% correct. It's also something else, though. Doubt comes in when you're when you are trying to become powerful, and that's what's happening, and doubt's always going to try to hang on. But in the power column, when you do the work of the core narrative and you really accept the fullness of your trauma and you really feel it, it tends to hurt more for maybe a week, two weeks, could even be a couple months. I'm not saying that you're stuck there, but... Just give yourself space to think of it as a mourning process. And it's your body's version of that. The body is uh, representing the physical representation of your mourning state. And I think that's what's going on, Beth, because you you really, we really hit what happened. Remember how emotional you were. So just for everybody out there listening, when you do a core narrative and you really come to it and you hit on what happened to you and you can feel it, it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt emotionally. It could hurt physically. And that's not going to last. None of that's going to last. Give yourself time to sit with the, the physical experience and recognize it is a physical representation of what you've suffered. And of course, you've been through a lot. So it's going to hurt a lot, but it's going to change. Beth, let me know if that helps. And if you need any more to go on, let me know. Sarah Ruto, good to see you here on Instagram. Thank you for joining us. Good to have you here. Okay, Lynn Slavensky, good to see you. Hi, in group, when we were working on my narrative, you said, trust the process, let it unfold. You don't have to do everything. Could you explain this some more? Thank you. Uh, I'd be happy to, Lynn. <clears throat> and in fact, it's a great follow-up to what I was just saying to Beth. Um, so Lynn and I worked in group. First, we worked to get her emotional uh, emotions column themes in order. And those themes are usually six to 12 themes that describe the major pockets of your life that can lead to flare-ups. And I know, Lynn, you found that very helpful. Then we moved on to, to doubt. And it doesn't have to go in the order of the columns. You can start anywhere in the column process, and they all work together. But Lynn and I did kind of go in order, and we started working on doubts. We started observing, articulating, and countering doubts, because that's what you do with doubts. Observing means to see that you were thinking it might be actually be true. That's not, you know, if you're seeing it might be true, you're not truly observing a doubt. To observe a doubt is to know it's not true, even though I still have the doubt. I worry that it's true, but I know it's not somewhere. That's observing. Articulating is to get it put into words, just what it sounds like. And we did that. Then we started countering doubts. And I think slowly but surely, these things started coming down. But then Lynn, I wanted to do the power work, power column work, which makes sense. Doing all three columns ultimately works very well together. And we started working on this core narrative and honing it. Now, uh, Beth really has what I think she feels to be a complete core narrative. Um, I think so too, but Beth, we can always tweak that if we need to. But Lynn, you're on the way towards building one. And what I wanted to encourage you when I said let the process unfold is that a lot of times people can feel like oh my God, how am I going to do this? I have to do the work. And what I want to tell you is the power column is, um, actually all the columns are great this way. Once you start doing the work of the power column, your mind is chewing on it. It's working on it. It's kind of like um, for anybody out there who does crossword puzzles, I do crossword puzzles and 
if you aren't getting it, you can set it down for like 45 minutes or come back the next day and your brain has been working on it. And that's what I mean, Lynn. Your brain is working on this. One of the reasons that Crushing Doubt works in this partnership of me and you and these dialogues work is that I talk to you and your brain takes it in and works on it and then comes back with it. I can't tell you how many times, and this is not just for Lynn, but for everybody, that I said something at one point and somebody comes back later and says, well, not only was that an interesting point, but listen to what else I came up with. And their mind just went places. So, you know, in many ways, the power column is about learning to trust your own mind and its process and knowing that you can get somewhere. When you're stuck in doubt, you're not going anywhere. You're in the same place. One of the reasons what I do helps is I get people unstuck from that place. I help them to recognize the doubt and it gets things moving again. Even the symptoms get moving again. And then the process is unfolding. So Lynn, you're already on your way. You don't have to do consciously so much work. Let's just see what comes up. Now, the one job you do have is just keep asking your questions. You don't have to do anything else. Just keep asking your questions, and especially in places where you can get them answered well. So this Q&A is a place where you can get it answered well. Lynn's in the group, though. And, um, you know, Lynn, I think you probably would attest to this, but I don't want to speak for you. Many people who come to the groups tell me this, and I, I just have seen it myself. The groups are a lot like the Q&A, but we can go so much further, so much faster. And why is that? Well, you're on a Zoom call with me. And <clears throat> when you ask your question, I'm going to have maybe some questions for you right on the spot, or you might have things to add, and we'll have a dialogue. And it's a quick dialogue of usually a couple minutes, maybe up to 10 minutes with one person. And we go back and forth, and we get much further in the understanding than we can do in a one you know one stop shop where you ask one question, I give one answer. Typically speaking, in groups, you you get many questions answered, and in fact, you get questions even brought to the surface that you didn't even know were there. That's part of my job. My job is always to get you for as far along as I can in your understanding of your own symptoms, whether it's the Q and A or the groups, but. If you are interested in the groups, go to my website, www.crushingdoubt.org. You can get the uh, the memberships there, the group memberships. They're once, twice, or three times a week. There's also the uh, seminars. I have a full seminar. It's eight sessions, 75 minutes each. And those seminars are designed to get you all of the knowledge that you need about mind-body experience. Like I, what I, from my angle... You don't need anything else except for those to know everything that you need to know. And it incorporates all of what the mind-body field says. Why do they say this? Why do they say this? How does this fit in here? So that can be a very helpful one. There's also an introduction, an introductory seminar that's only 50 minutes long that just tells you about the columns, how this works, why it can work. So all of those are available on the website. But um, Lynn, getting back to your question just briefly. The process is unfolding because we're having a dialogue about this. We've gotten you unstuck. Once you're unstuck, the brain, you got to remember, the brain ultimately, its ultimate goal is to have you receive the communication of the symptoms, to understand yourself. That's what it really wants. Now, when Sarno talks about the emotional distraction, it clearly that's the brain not wanting you to know something, but it only wants you to not know it in the moment. It does not necessarily intend for it to go where it then goes. Doubt picks up on that, though, and it tries to cement its its own process to say, anytime I need this, I need this. And if we feel we're in danger, we're going to have doubt there because it's saying, I've got to protect you. I've got to be here to protect you. Ultimately, we're going to convince the brain, nope, don't need protection. I actually want to receive this communication, and that's the power column wants to give it to you. And once you're on that way, your mind just works on it. So, Lynn, let me know if that makes sense to you. We'll keep working on it. If not, as I say to everybody, it <clears throat> doesn't matter what I think. It matters what you think. Your brain is what's going to determine what happens in your symptom life. So if you still have questions, even after I answer them, keep asking your questions. It just means I didn't answer it to your satisfaction yet, but we'll keep at it. Okay, Scotty Styles, good to see you. Lots of emojis. Thank you. Uh, Love Wins Always has joined us as well. Jackie Fitzgerald Groden is here as well. Good to see you guys. Thanks for joining me. Okay, Karen Isaacs says, my stepson got a great report. Fantastic. PET scan showed no new growth and small spot on liver shrunk. Glad to be back here. Karen, that's fantastic news. Karen had a, a terrible scare with her step, stepson, scary diagnosis, but it turned out much better than she expected. And um, 
you know, one of the things that she and I talked about, <clears throat> and I guess we talked about as a as a group here, is that when you have something really hard going on externally, it's going to be taxing for you. You know, that's part of what what goes into what's going on in your brain and what goes on in your brain is part of what goes on in your body. So it makes makes a whole lot of sense. Adam Gets Healthier uh, has joined us here and Rana Sonbol as well. Thank you for joining us. Uh, like that name, Adam Gets Healthier. I would love to help you with that. So um, I do want to say for anybody who's who's just joined or maybe doesn't know me so well, if you have questions about my system of how to uh, alleviate mind-body symptoms, I'm happy to talk about it again. It helps everybody, even if they've already heard it. I'm, I'm happy to say it again. And this happens in group, by the way, when uh, these groups that I have that are once, twice or three times a week. Part of the reason they work is that I reinforce it. We talk it over and over until it really just becomes second nature. And one of the reasons I created the groups is I had these teaching seminars that give lots of great information, and they do. But then after that, people needed reassurance or ways to build on that. And that's what the groups are for. So people always have access to me. Uh, you know, every every single week, I mean, I am off a couple days a month, but generally speaking, I'm here and I can answer your questions. Okay, stuck between stations. This is Scott. Scott, thank you for joining us here. Slowly continuing to make progress with the fatigue slash, slash energy. A little bit of progress with the neck, shoulder, and arms. Raccoon problem is still going on. Um, I don't know if that was a typo or if I'm not remembering something. Um, tell me what that is, Scott. Uh, maybe you'll make reference to it in your notes afterwards. I'll see. Allegedly, allegedly will be resolved. Oh, it must have been a raccoon problem, an actual raccoon problem. I'm sorry. I think in terms of mind-body hypotheticals so much that I was like, hmm, does he have bags under his eyes? What is that? Um, but <clears throat> this may be an example of when an outside stressor is causing a lot of problems. So sounds like that. Sorry for being dense, Scott. Okay. This has been going on for two months. And as a renter, uh -huh, there isn't much we, you can do. So this is real raccoons, which I think is adding to my frustration, which is better than fear or doubt. So yes, absolutely. Um, I talk about something in, in the book I'm writing. Um, it's called the fear confidence spectrum. And essentially, you are moving from the far extreme of fear, where it's paralyzing and you think that everything's going to be horrible forever. And you move through that, through the levels of doubt, uh, I shouldn't say levels of doubt. That gets confusing with the way I talk, but different forms of doubt. You go from fear to, okay, I'm, le I'm less afraid, but I'm still confused. And then you bring down confusion, but I'm still not certain. And then you start to get certain, but I still have questions. And you're moving along that line until you hit confidence. Now, it's similar with fear and frustration. Frustration is something that tends to come up more around confusion or lack of certainty. It does not tend to come up as much with fear because fear is so overwhelming, you almost don't have time or energy to be frustrated. I suppose you can be, but it's secondary to the fear. So, um, but I do want to say one thing, Scott, about this raccoon situation. You're saying as a renter, there's not much you can do. Whenever you're in a not much you can do situation, that's going to bring your power down. It's going to give you a sense of, you know what? I'm stuck. I'm in a bad spot. There's nothing I can do. So lowered power is going to increase doubt in some form and, and frustration. We'll keep working on this, though. There's often things that you can do within the confines of your own mind, even if you can't change the situation outside, to feel powerful again. So let's talk. Now, uh, Scott says, but still, playing into the quote, if you only had realized all this sooner, you might be a homeowner, which has its own issues, I know, etc. Okay, so... That, to me, speaks to power is diminishing and you're starting to attack yourself in other ways, which brings down power. And that tends to build on itself. In the power column, one thing we learn to do is to break that cycle. You know, in the doubt column, we have a cycle of thought, usually about mind, about our bodily experience and doubts about whether it's mind body or it can be made to go away or whether we can, we can be the ones to make it go away. But in the power column, we doubt ourselves. I mean, that level three doubt, doubt about self, we work on in the power column because if you don't, you can get into a real cycle with yourself where you just keep doubting yourself more and more. And people who've been through trauma tend to doubt their own reality to begin with. And if you're doubting your reality, it's very hard to be confident. Then Scott says, made a realization about my guilt of freedom slash free time days off, actually having a root in fear 
because of Australia where his most traumatic experience happened. So maybe changing the core narrative again. The core narrative is usually a work in progress, guys. Um, and one thing that I like to encourage people is the end result isn't what matters. It's the doing of it. Because the doing of it is like high-speed therapy. We just keep looking at the center of things and we don't get distracted and we don't get into meandering conversations or, oh, today this happened. We focus on who are you at your core? What happened? How did it affect you? And how do you want to change it? And so, Scott, this is it's good to rework this. And like I said to Lynn, the process is going on. So let's just keep having the discussions. The dialogue is what gets us there. Keep asking your questions, okay? Okay, Karen Isaacson says, what about old symptoms coming back? I called Sarno 20 years ago about horrible allergies. He asked what was going on. I was moving in with my now husband. He explained good events are stressful. Uh, then Karen says, I went to a therapist. Allergies subsided. Mostly not bad for years till two weeks ago. I know it's TMS, but annoying. So it definitely is. Um, Karen, one thing that can happen, just to keep your eye out for it, is old symptoms tend to come back when new symptoms get mastered. Um, so not even new symptoms, when a symptom gets mastered. You got to remember, doubt is always looking for places to stand. It's looking to build solid ground. And it's going to go wherever it can. So if it can confuse you with, wait a minute, I thought that old symptom was gone. What's it doing back here? It'll pounce there. And I, I never worry too much about the specific form doubt takes because what I understand is it took that form because it's it's plausible to you. It's believable to you or it captures your imagination enough that it can rest there. So for whatever reason, your mind, I think, was open enough to this. I'm not saying critically of you. This is just doubt will pounce where it can. It probably kind of felt like, you know, we haven't been here in a while. Maybe this will fool her. And it went right there. What I want you to do is think of all symptoms as the same. Old symptoms, new symptoms. If there's symptoms in your head, shoulders, knees, back, you know, bladder, wherever, it doesn't matter where it is. Just treat it all the same as doubt. So, you know, I listen, doubt relies on confusion as one, one of the things that it, it relies on. It would be naturally confusing to be like, why did this symptom come back here? It came back just because it could confuse you. You know, um, and I know that it can be hard to say, well, what, why specifically? We'd have to know a lot of ins and outs of what is going on in your mind that would go back there. But here's one example. Sometimes an old symptom can come back because there's a very, very similar theme going on. So this happened when you were moving in with your now husband. If, for example, you are now, I don't know, this probably isn't what happened, but I'm just saying for illustration, if you had bought like a vacation home or something like that, and you were about to move into another place with him, and then this symptom came up, we'd have to say, hey, look, these symptoms can attach to, to similar issues. So sometimes that can happen. Sometimes it can go back to an old one because it's really trying to scare you because you're becoming powerful. And that's actually what I suspect is going on here, Karen. I don't know for sure but I want to explore it. When people are becoming powerful, doubt tries to go for the strongest place it can go to. And so sometimes it goes back to the source, the original source, or one of the old sources. For me, when I am becoming powerful, sometimes it'll go to back pain, which is interesting because you'd think that that would be a pretty weak place to go because I've conquered back pain, but it's not because uh, I mean, it is and it isn't. I suppose it's it's a place where I'm very strong against doubt overall. It's never going to beat me in the long term, but it can beat me in the short term because I got lots of scary memories about that. So it could pounce there. Um, that's a partial answer, Karen. I think we should keep talking about it and get your questions answered. But I gave you two reasons why it can go back to old things. And actually, in, in some ways, a third, because the and the third is the most important. Doubt just wants you confused. If you just recognize it as doubt, you almost don't even need to bother with it. It's just doubt. The whole thing is doubt. Keep working to bring it down and every symptom will go away. Okay, let me know if that, that helps, uh, Karen, or if you need more to go on. Okay, Jane Smith says, Hi, Dr. Dan. Missed you last week. You too, Jane. Thanks for being here. As you mentioned, you would be working on your book. I wrote a testimonial for you and crushing down. Thank you. If you'd like to use it for your book or website, etc. Jane, I really appreciate it. 
and uh, would love to use that. So um, it really is helpful. You know, anybody who says, hey, this has helped, it, it's, you know, think about it this way. Whenever anybody's looking for how am I going to get helped, how are they supposed to choose? You know, I try to represent it so in a way that really sounds good, but it's really helpful to have people validating this worked for me. Here's why it worked because people are sorting through a lot of material trying to figure out what's going to help. So Jane, I appreciate it. Okay. Then Jane said, I can post my testimonial in the comments for you as it's too long to put in the chat. Okay. Uh, Jane, that'd be great. And then um, we can talk about it, but I really do appreciate it. And I'm glad that you're having a good experience. You know, that's the main thing when I hear about a testimonial is that you must have had some good experiences, which of course I know you have from what you've told me. But um, it's always gratifying to see that people are are moving forward in their symptoms and making gains and feeling that what uh, what I'm doing is working. Uh, speaking of the working on the book, I just want to update you guys. I had take I had taken last week off to work on the book. I cranked out an entire chapter in this current edit, and it was a big one, one that took a lot of work. I have one more big chapter to go, and then two small chapters. And then that edit round will be done, and I have just one round of editing left. So uh, looking at a late summer, early fall release, there should be a pre-order uh, set up soon. I'm hoping in about a month. I'll keep you posted. Okay? Thanks so much. All right. Now, Scott is continuing uh, this story. He says, and they are raising my rent after all of this. Oy. I mean, these are the kind of things that can cause, especially emotions column symptoms, that just it's very annoying and upsetting when something's going wrong and the person who is responsible for fixing it then asks you for something, which happens all the time, unfortunately, but it really goes you know, a long way towards making symptoms. And I'm doing fairly successfully to fight against the, oh, of course this is happening to me, et cetera, which I would have done before, and just accept this is crappy landlord practices per this day and age. Okay, um, that's very good, Scott, that you're doing that. I do want to say um, you're doing something here that I would interpret as kind of a power column action step. Action steps are the ways that you actively try to change your thinking to address a, a mind-body problem. And Scott feeling out of power, that's a power column problem. So an action step is to recognize, you know what, this isn't about me. This isn't about, oh, of course, this would happen to me because people feel they can pick on me or whatever. Instead, he's locating that elsewhere. He's saying, you know what? This is bad landlord practices. This is just something where from the outside, this person uh, or this group of people or whatever is doing a terrible job and they're just mis mistreating me. That helps to locate the power within yourself and recognize, okay, you can do crappy things to me, but you can't make me feel bad about me. And Scott, I know that's a work in progress, but just wanted to reflect back for you and everybody that that's a power column solution. And the more you do that, the more powerful you're going to feel. Recognizing the bad that people do in the world is part of the power column. That's part of our trauma experience. We've all had a lot of mistreatment, and I'm sorry that's happening to you, Scott, but I like that you're recognizing it outside of you. Okay, Jane Smith says uh, to Karen Isaacs, fantastic news about your stepson. Absolutely echoing that, Jane, and thanks for cheering her on. Okay, now Lynn Slavensky says, actually, after, our, after last group, my mind did come up with another insight based on what you and others said, which I will share Friday. So this is an example of, of what I mean. Thank you for sharing that, Lynn. This is an example of what I mean about how the brain's working on it the process just starts to unfold. And um, the columns are really a very exciting thing because they can describe the human condition. And I, as we talk about it, I can say, oh, did you notice this fits with the emotions column? And did you notice this part fits with the doubt column? And that's a big part of what we do in group too, is to label it, to practice it, so that people can get used to the idea of, oh, that's what you mean by the columns. That's how we can work with this. So, Lynn, thank you for sharing. That's fantastic. Um, what it shows is it's not all about what I say. It's about the process. And the process is one of just understanding things more. Lynn, you're understanding things more and more and more. And the more you understand, the more you will understand. That's what it's all about. Thank you for sharing. I really appreciate it. Okay, Rana Sunbull, you've got a question or a comment. 
Rana says, hi, Dan. Thank you for everything you do. You are welcome, Rana. I appreciate it. I have been watching your videos and applying the TMS approach. My pain has definitely decreased. Fantastic. Yet what is lingering is the neck cracking. Uh, and uh, let's see. And it keeps me in doubt since it feels so physical. Okay. Uh, great. I love when you guys, anytime you guys bring up questions, it's so helpful because I can help you, but there's so many people out there who are having the same kind of questions and we can fit it all in the framework. So I'm going to answer this in a second. I just want to say hi to a couple of people. Joel Basis, thanks for joining us. And Muscle1213, thank you for joining us here as well. As I said before, anybody who's new here or has any questions about how I work or how, how this works or even why it works, I'm happy to answer that. The reason I answer questions is to further your understanding of what's happening in the mind-body world. And it, there should not really not be any contradictions. If there seem to be, bring that up. And I want to be able to answer that so you can see why these discrepancies can fit together or why it's one way at one time and another way at another time. Okay, so Ron is talking about how physical issues can seem so convincing. Uh, you know, oh, actually, you said more about this. Hold on. Then you said, my neck and shoulder pain has decreased since listening to your work. Okay, yet what lingers is the grinding and cracking in my neck. One of the things that doubt relies on is sounds. The more, and, and not just sounds, but swelling. Doubt loves anything that is compelling and convincing. And if it can make you swell up or have cracking noises or grinding, then people say to me, oh my God, it must be physical. So Ron, I want to offer this to you, but everybody else. Mind-body issues are physical. We're not distinguishing between physical or not. And that's a very important point. And I understand why you're thinking, Ron. We've all thought it. So have I. But what's helped me is to recognize it's all physical. A mind-body experience can make cracking noises and grinding noises. I'll give you an example just in terms of the pathways where that can happen. Well, all it takes for there to be all kinds of popping in your joints and things like that is for some air bubbles to get into your to get into the gaps between the joints. And how does that happen? Well, you know, if there's changes in oxygen delivery, which is one of the things Sarno talked about, there can be more oxygen flowing into the bloodstream and it can go to these joints and it can start to bubble up. And so I now have started to think of grinding and popping as a sign of the mind-body process in action. I don't even worry about it. I know it might sound a little bit weird, but I don't think, uh-oh, is there something physically wrong with me? I really don't think that about most of my physical experience anymore. I think instead of my body as a flowing emotion, I think of my entire body as an extension of the brain. This is just one big brain. And unless I a crane falls on me or I run full speed into a brick wall, everything that I'm experiencing in the body is a physical representation of my mind's experience. So it makes sense that you would have doubt about this, but what I want you to help you think about, Rana, is there can be very real physical changes that are mind-body in nature. And so when you say it feels so physical, it is physical. The, the question, though, is where does it come from? Why is it there? Rana, I want to know whether that helps you. Because as I say to everyone, it doesn't matter whether I think it. That only helps me what I think. I want to help you decide what you think about it. But hopefully my answer could bring down doubt or make you think about things in a different way or even bring up a uh, a question, another question that's just further down the line towards understanding. So let's keep working at it and let me know what you need, okay? Thanks, Rana. Okay, Jane Smith says, I'm so stressed out, I'm sorry to hear that, work and family that I have chest pains. I'm worried I'm doing real damage to my body and will bring on a heart attack or something, but I can't seem to calm my body down. Arg, help. Okay, Jane, a um, couple things I want to say. First of all, um, mind-body processes usually are benign. They're totally benign um, and reversible. So when do people have, listen, you can have a mind-body driven autoimmune attack or even a heart attack can come from a mind-body experience. However, there are two components that tend to drive it, that sort of thing. One is, it's got to be the, working on your body for a long time. And don't freak out, Jane, because I know it has been working for a long time, because here's the other one. You also have to be very unaware of it. 
it tends to be that the people who have autoimmune issues and heart attacks and things like that, usually the combination is they've got a lot of emotional distress and they're not aware of it. So uh, there was the ACE study, the Adverse Childhood Experiences study, and it showed that people who had adverse childhood experiences were more likely to have uh, all kinds of major conditions, including autoimmune issues, heart disease, um, you know, lower life expectancies and things like that. But what it didn't factor in, as far as I know, is awareness level. What I have found, and this is actually just partially anecdotally, when I talk to people who have had major issues of these kinds, more typically, more often than not, they had a trauma history and they were not very aware. In fact, uh, this is one that probably would be a little bit controversial for people, but I don't shy away from the controversial. I, I'm going towards observation, science, and logic. And what I have found is even people who develop Alzheimer's, the people who tend to develop Alzheimer's tend to be goodists who are constantly taking care of people who are a somewhat psychologically defended. And it's like they don't want to remember things, and then they don't. And so, Jane, I would be shocked if you're at any actual risk for a heart attack. However, let me just say one thing. Get checked out by a doctor. You know, a medical doctor is the one who will know about these things. But if you're not showing any medical signs from the, te you know, tests, like, it would be one thing if you were saying, I've got a 90% blockage in an artery and I'm stressed out and I'm having chest pains. Then I'd be worried I'd send you to a doctor. I would be shocked if that's what's going on. Get checked out by a doctor. The chances are that you're going to be totally fine from a medical standpoint. And if that's the case, all you need is awareness to avoid anything that's really bad. Think about it this way, Jane. You're experiencing the stress directly. That's actually a mitigating factor against things like a heart attack. To experience it directly is to detoxify it. Jane, please do let me know if that helps enough and we'll keep at it. But even if you are all revved up for a very long time, if you know about it and you know why, you're not going to do real damage to your body. Again, that's how I think about it. I can back up with science and logic why I'm right, but it doesn't matter what I think. It matters what you think. So let's keep going with that. Follow up as needed. Okay. Scott says, yes, Dan, doing much better pushing back against the powerless feeling. Good. This is all brought. Still a work in progress, but some victories. Going out more, mowed the, mowed the yard for the first uh first uh it must be time oh hold on a second this is a follow which was unthinkable a month or two ago it's really huge you know I'm, i've worked with people before where yes these unthinkable things they're doing and you know what's interesting we often don't celebrate these victories enough we think well yeah that's true but doubt's favorite word is but if you find yourself saying but think wait hold on has doubt gotten in here back up Remember where you were, note your progress, and think, if you've progressed this far in this time, where will you be in two months from now? Uh, this is something that comes up for a lot of people. People ask me, well, how come I read in Sarno and some other mind-body books, or I hear testimonials about people getting better fast? There are people who get better fast from certain mind-body issues, but typically speaking, that, that's not that's not how it goes. And even for the people who it does go that way, they usually have symptoms then come in later and they've got to rework it. The fact is the mind-body process is the human condition. We, we've got it for life and we've got to keep working at it, okay? But if we keep making progress, and there are times it happens to me too. I'm like, oh my God. So I've been getting better from this um, foot injury I had. It's almost all better now. And uh, sometimes I think, but it's still not better. I don't, it's still not all better. I don't know why. And then I think, well, where was I two months ago? And I'm like, oh, yeah, it's totally different. So my feeling is keep working on the columns. Keep working on your understanding and your confidence that this can get better and will get better. And it will. You just keep pushing on doubt. Keep pushing against it. Okay, Scott says, that's good news, Karen. Um, that was in relation to, uh, let's see. I don't know what that was referring to. That was probably in relation to the symptoms shifting uh, to to old symptoms. I, I don't know for sure, but if that's what you meant, Scott, I, that is good news because anytime the symptoms have to move off of the current symptom, doubt is in trouble. 
But if you meant something else, let me know. Okay, then Karen Isaac said, love the body as a flowing emotion. Uh, it's an after, I don't I, it might have been an analogy, but it is really important to uh, think emotionally. And it just helps me to think the body is expressing whatever I feel. That's true, going all the way back to the beginning of this, that um, Beth and I were, or Beth had talked about the core narrative and the symptoms going up. Your body's expressing things all the time. And so just think of it as another barometer. It's another way to feel. Okay, then Jane says, um, I'm really scared because a close relative is sick and I lost uh, a brother-in-law. I am really afraid to lose anyone else. Well, I certainly understand that, Jane. I want to offer a thought about, um, I'll, I'll leave that up actually so people can see what we're talking about. But one of the thoughts that I want to offer here is that the antidote to fear is often power. If you can go live in your power column and feel connected to your purpose in life and feel really rooted in who you are and what you're all about, you're going to be spending your time thinking about that. Fear takes us away from that. So it is a very active thing we can do to say, you know what? I'm here for this. This process right here, what I'm doing right now, it takes away a huge amount of fear for me because I feel like this is what I'm here to do. I have other purposes as well, but this is one of the main ones. And so I'm in it. I'm doing my powerful thing. And it makes me so much less afraid. So Jane, you and look, you don't have to know what it is yet, but I want to look for that. I want to find it and I want to expand into it. And the reason I'm telling it to you now is you're not stuck here. Sometimes you can think, uh-oh, people are getting sick, I'm losing people, I'm getting older, there's mortality out there. I was feeling that way even just a couple months ago as I'm kind of hitting midlife in a lot of ways. Hopefully, I have a long time uh, to go. And um, then I had a, a session with my own therapist where we changed that around. We got it into a more powerful position where there was recognition of, oh, you know what? I have an opportunity to do things in all kinds of different ways in this second half of life. And suddenly I was back in my power and not nearly as afraid. So my main point to you, Jane, this fear is alterable. Fear is a symptom. Let's treat it as such. It can change. It's not about the facts. You know, doubt loves to convince us, oh, these are just facts. What? What? I'm just, I'm just facts. Doubt is a pathological liar. It is always trying to fool you. And it's trying to get you into fear and feeling like, oh, there's no hope. That's doubt for you, but it's just doubt and it's going to lose and power is the antidote. Okay. Let's keep talking about it. Okay. Ron has got a follow-up cooking that. Thanks for joining us here. We do have a couple minutes left. So if you have a question to get in, do let me know. Uh, and I believe you've been here before, but if you haven't and you have questions about how my system works about, uh, alleviating mind body symptoms, uh, I can help with these short-term symptoms that just came on. I can deal with long-term symptoms that haven't budged. I can deal with low level things that are just hanging on. And also just affect your life in a positive way. These columns really help. So I'm happy to say more for anybody out there. Okay. And for people out there who are watching, you know, not live, feel free to make comments. I mean, these are, this is all about you asking your questions and getting them answered. So Rana has a follow-up. Yes, it makes sense. And believing that these sounds, so we were talking about sounds and how they make people feel that it's so physical. Um. Yes, it makes sense. And believing that these sounds are mind and body would help my anxiety about it. I'm just traumatized with many people in groups saying it's a sign of instability in the spine. Okay, Rana, I'm going to say something. It's fairly extreme, but it is for you and for your help. When you go to groups or anywhere, even if you go to uh, doctors or even mind-body experts, they all have doubt. They all have doubts of their own, and they're going to spread it everywhere. So what I want to encourage you is choose, shrink the circle of trust. Choose the people that you can trust very carefully during this um, period of recovery. When I was getting better, I basically reduced it to two people, Sarno and me. I wouldn't listen to anybody else. I could take bits and pieces from people if that made sense. But if it did not make full sense, I rejected it. I held on to Sarno like he was God. Because I was like, this guy generally gets it in ways that other people don't. I'm not listening to anybody else. 
I'm just going to keep rereading his books and thinking about it myself. Now, I did need to get answers in other places, but that's what I did. I shrunk that circle of trust. I want you to do that, especially when you guys go on groups. Pain sufferers and symptom sufferers who are not doing well are filled with doubt, and they will try to make you doubt. And part of the reason they're doing that is that, you know, as bad as they're feeling, they want some company. They're like, I want to know that this isn't just me. The interesting thing is it should be going the opposite way. We need to be fighting doubt with everybody. Everybody should be going on those groups trying to inspire hope. Now, who can do that, though, when they're suffering? A lot of people can't, and that's okay. Uh, I understand it, but protect yourself from anybody who inspires doubt in you. Protect yourself from anything that inspires doubt. We've got to get to certainty with science and logic. Pick the people you you can trust to give you information, okay? And I'm here anytime. So if you need to reach me, it's dan at crushingdoubt.org. You can go to my website, www.crushingdoubt.org. You can get my seminars. You can sign up for groups. I'm accessible all the time. I want you to have answers, and I want you to feel solid and confident, and I want you to be protected from people who cause doubt for you. So it is great to be here with you all. I will be back here same time next week. That is Thursdays at 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Pacific. And uh, let's keep it up, guys. Great, great questions. We will keep it coming. I will keep the answers coming. And hold me to as high a standard as you want. I want to answer these questions to your satisfaction. Okay? Uh, oh, Karen Isaacs did have something to say before we go. I'm embracing 62 years old. I'm better than ever, and this work is the reason. That's great, Karen. I wouldn't want to go back to my 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. I do want to work on liking what I physically see, saggy arms. Okay, yes, we definitely have to work on helping you be loving towards yourself. And, uh, you know, it it can be hard in certain ways for us all, but attacking yourself brings down power. It doesn't matter how old you are. You know, when you're in your 90s, you can be powerful. And that's my plan. I'm going to plan to be powerful my whole life. And hopefully beyond. Hopefully there's more beyond. So Rita, thanks for the thanks for the flowers. It's been great to be here with you. Jane Smith then says, ah, what a great idea to shrink my circle of trust. Thanks, Dr. Dan. Always helpful. You are welcome, Jane. I found it to be invaluable. Um, you know, and kind of use me as a consultant and hold me accountable to that too. Uh, uh, the thing, one thing that I value about the work that I do and what I offer to people is I don't hand people doubt. Uh, I certainly don't try to. It can happen inadvertently, but then we work to clear it up. And so I think I can be particularly trust trustworthy in that regard. Okay, thank you guys. Look forward to seeing you same time next week and we'll keep it up. Keep asking the questions. I'll keep up the answers. Thanks so much.